Packers are in. Uh, screwed it up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, welcome to the Fireside Tattoo Podcast, episode 2000. Really? I, it has to be. It's a big episode. 2000. It feels like it. I actually, I, I already did a podcast today. This is my second one. How many have you done? Five. Today? Yeah. Shit. <laughs> uh, all right. <clears throat> well, um, let's... Uh, let's well, we got a housekeeping out of the way first. Go to um, you know all of our social media and keep up with us, and uh, and sign up for our mailing list at Fireside. No, at TattooImprovement dot com. I think Scott finally has all of our stuff transitioned from Fireside to Tattoo Improvement Network. Like if you go to Instagram or now, hopefully even Facebook, if Facebook approves the change, um, you know they're a little they don't they're a little Nazi ish, yeah. Uh, but um, so. This is Adam Shaw. You should know him by now. He's been on. Hello. He's like the the new co-host here, mm. it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the reason that, that we came back on tonight is because you've probably heard us talk a good bit about our Inside Fireside mentorship group that we've been doing, and we are on the downside. There's one assignment left. Week 11 came out yesterday, and week 12 comes out next week, and that is it. And um, we're washing our hands of these people and kicking them out the door and being like, don't call me, I'll call you. Mm. No, that's not true. We're going to miss these guys. They've, uh, uh, But we've, we've tried to put our heads together and figure out kind of the most common issues that we're seeing. And as the course has progressed, you know, we've, we, we saw some problems starting out just drawing from life. Um, recognizing the difference between dark shapes and light shapes and trying to keep those families fairly separated so that you didn't end up with a lot of really flat imagery. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then since the last time that we've talked on the show, we've really gotten into color. And so the way that we structured this thing was was dealing with shapes first and then values, trying to be really value-focused and then dealing with lines and edges and then kind of pushing color in towards the end. And... It seems like when our artists got into color, some of them kind of lost uh, a sense of value. Yeah, it kind of threw everybody off, I think. Yeah. Well, in a way. Why does that happen? Um, because if you're focused on... We, we, did a, we did a week on analogous colors and then a week on complementary colors. Right. And I think maybe people got too focused on that and then they forgot about the other values and yeah <laughs> and shapes yeah. that we want them to keep in mind it the whole way right so that was and tough and, yeah it, it, it was and you know it's <clears throat> i think people recognize it whenever we because excuse me with these um you know with these assignments we're literally drawing on top of their drawings and uh, you know whether in photoshop or on a, in a drawing app or whatever and sending them back and um, I, I think that they recognize it really quickly when we send it back. Yeah, the responses that I've got have been like, oh, yeah, I, I see that. Uh, but for whatever reason, whenever someone's selecting, oh, when we went from grayscale and someone's selecting like, you know, they're working in complementaries and they're working in like a lot of red warm tones in the skull maybe and then some kind of like green tones in the fabric or whatever it might be. Uh, they're just grabbing a red and not really considering where it sits on the on the value scale. And there are tools for that. You know, um, we've talked about Russ Abbott's color wheel for tattooers. That's a that's a great tool. But um, you know, a lot of the paint companies, uh, like Gamblin, I know has uh, all like a chart of all of their paints. Have you? Do you have any tips that people could uh, maybe like? grab some PDF downloads and, and look and see where, like, what, or maybe maybe it's not even something literal like that. Do you have any tips for how to keep that in mind um, when you're dealing with color? Because sometimes people will confuse, like, high-key colors with light values. But sometimes they're really high-key and they're actually pretty dark. Yeah, they can be high-key and be middle tone. And yeah. it flattens things out. And um, I think... The best way I can, I've used this with my work is, um, you know, uh, doing a lot of squinting at your uh-huh. your image and uh, seeing what still pops out in terms of value. And then also, uh, you know, try to take a quick shot of it and convert it in your 
um, Photoshop or whatever program you're using and, and you know, you can quickly see once it in, it's in grayscale if you're maintaining those values. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've, we've given that um, piece of advice before and I think that's really valuable if you just drop uh, into grayscale. And we, we did a tutorial, I don't know how long it was, but one of our fireside techniques actually, um, I made a little Photoshop template that's hollow in the center or transparent in the center and it has a, a, like a five-step value scale so that you can actually pull your grayscale I think it's even set up where you can pull a color image in. It will automatically convert it to grayscale. And then you can not only look and see where your grays are on the value scale, but you can also make sure that you're getting a full value range, like a super dark, dark, and the lightest light possible. Um, you guys, I don't know what that I don't know what that episode was called, but there's only 20-some-odd technique episodes. Are you trying to pull it up? Um, that might help you, and it's free. It, it, uh, we just included it as a download with the video. Um, so with you having a comic background and you draw a lot of covers for like pulp, um, novels and things like that, those are images that have to read from a distance because you're looking at, at a book on a shelf and you want to the viewer to recognize it from a long ways away and, and be drawn to it. And so I asked you to bring a few, uh, drawings tonight and we'll drop these over, I think that everyone can learn a lot from comic artists in general. A lot of tattooers can learn a lot from comic artists. What What's the episode number? Five. Episode five of Fireside Technique uh, was that one with the value scale. It still has the thing okay, cool. Yeah, and, then, and if you want to download it, you, you still have it. Um, one thing when I was just going through your uh, your covers here, your drawings, is that you really you're using complementaries a lot, but you're you're staying very conservative with your with the number of colors that you're using like you'll you'll stay almost monochromatic except for one little pop of a complementary or something like that like this one for example with you know it's almost all in blues and blue grays except for the moon uh which is in which is in oranges uh and yellow or warmer tones and um and then in addition to uh changing the temperature you also uh change the color intensity and like the in the saturation so your blues are pretty bright and then your moon is light and then the oranges and yellows that are in the moon are more subdued so you're using a lot of kind of tools at one time to create a, a dynamic image yeah um i mean the a lot of uh, cover artists use that kind of technique where you have one giant shape that pops okay. and then you know, the rest of the elements of the image will kind of slowly, oh, yes, uh, I'm noticing that now. Now I'm <clears throat> noticing there's some figures in there and stuff. So that was the idea. This actually is white. Yeah. There yeah. is some orange on there, some kind of um, brown. Mm -hmm. But I left an area. Re I wanted it to really kind of glow. Right. So so you're thinking of one dominant element that catches people. And, and now they're looking at books. And this book cover, I mean, how big are these books printed? But like these uh, series that light, you're doing? Uh, nine by six. Okay. So it's smaller than a lot of tattoos even. Yeah. And so you're trying to find a dominant image that catches people right off the bat. And that's where you're starting? Like whenever you're building this? Yeah, when I build the composition, yeah. When yeah. I'm looking at a, a thumbnail. When I do the thumbnail stage, I want, to, you know. I try different shapes that are dominant and then, you know, yeah, building it from there. Talk for a second about thumbnails and what you're doing when you're laying out thumbnails, what you're thinking. Um, well, at first, you know, of course, the the narrative is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a character that is uh, uh, supposed to be featured, he's, uh, you know, he's the main he's the main guy so you want him to pop out but then you you start to um yeah build the larger shapes i always start with large shapes when i'm doing thumbnails and of course you know thumbnails are just you know it takes five seconds to or right. three seconds to draw something to really i mean you can make a really impactful image in seconds on a page if you're just doing little bitty and and you're keeping it to like three values, you know, mm -hmm. black, uh, uh, gray, and white. Yeah. Um. You can make like a really dynamic 
image. And you're not getting caught up in anything. You're just thinking in the most basic shapes and establishing like uh, light, light, like light, dark, and mid, and that's it. So you, so in this one, for example, um, really quickly, you were able to determine that the moon was the lightest shape, which obviously that makes sense. The moon is light in the sky, and so that, and once you have that idea down, it really helps to dictate what the rest of the composition might look like. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. I needed these twin guys and then the the planet or the moon. I don't I think it's our moon. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just assumed. Yeah. Uh and and so keeping it mostly monochromatic, you know, the blues in the background, the um you know, the light that's the the figures are the darkest area. So your foreground is dark, your midground is your lightest, and then your background is your mid. So and you can stack those any number of ways. You could have gone, you know, super light in the foreground, mid tones in the midground, and and almost black in the night sky sure. if you'd wanted. So, yeah. but, but the thumbnails help you to make that decision. Yeah, pretty yeah. quickly. I mean, yeah, you can easily you know sketch in dark shapes and 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 determine what's going to be the best. Um, I mean, I think I did go with, you know, I had some thumbnails that were like, you're talking the, the values the were first. flipped a little bit and it was cool, but I just wanted to go with this one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did all of these figures here were originally, um, like a, a gray, like a blue gray. I think it yeah. was Payne's gray. I really like Payne's gray. I paint with that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I started in with a little bit of subtle browns in their faces. I didn't add much color, you know, added a little bit of color, just like reflective color on their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then I let this whole shape, most of the painting process was remained white. And then I went in with the, uh, the orange brown tone. Yeah. And, and keeping in mind outside of just a couple of little pops of color here and there, Almost everything in these figures is darker than any part of the of the moon or planet behind it. Outside of you know where where the where you where this transitional area happened, where the dark side of the moon, yeah, um, the dark side of the moon met their heads. You kind of had this kind of flip flop where you've got some strong lights on their forehead. Yeah. But even those lights don't compete with the lights in the the lightest areas of the yeah. moon. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I think I probably had them lighter earlier. But I didn't. I didn't want them to pop out like that. I wanted to. I wanted you to see the moon first, and then mm -hmm. there was a stage. I mean, you can get that stage in the thumbnail stage while you're drawing. You can think about, okay, I want the eye to go here. One, two, three. You know, and just you know, mm -hmm. really think about yeah. like where the eye, what stage of eye uh, viewing do you want? Yeah. Let's let's grab another one just so we can. Well, there's a. Oh, okay, see, the, and this is a really similar, uh, not, not layout, but um, palette, and uh, and in this one, you your strongest lights are in the foreground, yeah, uh, and then your uh, darks are in the midground, and then your medium tones are in the background. So you kind of flip flopped it, but it's still, uh, it's still structured that way. Yeah, yeah. You mean like a. Uh, we, I was planning, he was going to send us images. We're going to drop it in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. We'll, we'll point as we're going. So, oh, you want to point? Yeah, we'll point going? and then okay. we'll cut that, cut it in and out. Um, but so the same idea, almost monochromatic in the, um, yeah. in the background, uh, and mid ground. And then the only pops of color, which are complementary colors, you've got these kind of oranges against these blues come from the light that, that, uh, that starts with the lamp and, and, and reflects on their faces. Um, I think these are great examples because the co you, you don't, since color is subdued in these drawings, uh, it, it, I think it will make it easier for people to, to consider value first instead of just thinking like, okay, I can, like, I need to separate this building from the background. So I'm going to make the building reddish and the b background blue. Right, you know what right. I mean? Uh, if if you're focusing on keeping the color variety down to a minimum, the variety of colors down to a minimum, then it probably makes it easier to to focus on value and like slowly creep into color. Yeah, and that's how I approach it usually. It's I'm right. thinking that way. I mean, I um I like the kind of, you know, 
moonlit scene mm-hmm. and how and what you know night at night colors are um more simplified right in my mind you know because uh, everything kind of gets muted. Yeah. And I like that idea. I like the moonlight idea. Now, um, there is some, you know, a discussion on whether moonlight makes things blue. I don't know that it does. I think it might just make things kind of gray. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I think in James Gurney's book, he talks he does about have a chapter moonlight. On yeah. But I think it's just dramatic to just pick a color and go with that in terms of, like, what the moon is doing to everything. I think it's cool blue. I mean, everybody thinks that way. I think in our imagination, moonlight makes everything blue. So, you know, I think it's it's fun for a cover. Yeah, I I agree. But, yeah, the, the, the warmness is kind of creeping into the moonlit scene. Yeah. And when you, when you just trying to think of, of if people are struggling with this idea, which I understand I, I do myself sometimes, especially if I get too carried away with color. That's why I think these are such good examples. Uh, you know, if you're just introducing, if you have a really limited palette like this and um, almost everything's monochromatic and you introduce your lights, say, in with with warm tones, then you can say, all right, anytime I'm dipping into yellow or white for that matter, uh, I'm dealing with a light family. So that's the only, and if I'm going into blues, then I'm, then it's not going to get past this point on the value scale. Like you can almost draw a line in the sand and say only my yellows, orange, only my warm tones are going to be light and everything else is going to be from step four to six or whatever on, on whatever yeah. my, my value scale. Yeah. Um, I think I made that decision on this one. I mean, there that you could make the moon pretty bright, but I didn't want it to compete with right. the lantern or their faces, so I kind of muted it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because it would have jumped forward if you had. Um, now it also helps that it's cool and that the their light is warm. That helps them to push forward. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you had gone like light or sharpen the edges of the moon or anything like that, or had any real strong pops of light, then it would have jumped forward and you wouldn't know where to, where to look. And that's the kind of issues that I think we're seeing a lot in, in some of the drawings that are coming through the, uh, find your style group. Yeah. Um, all right, let's try another one. We're on a roll. Oh, okay. I just think that the more examples, the better, because this is such a common issue. Naked? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We love naked. Okay, great. This is the fireside. Um, (laughs) Uh, this is sort of a similar idea. Uh, she, I wanted her to pop out, of course, mm-hmm. and uh, it, you know the moonlit scene. Yeah, and it introduces almost everything else has been oh, really only about two colors, and you introduced uh, the green, purples, greens, and the kind of warm, fleshy oranges and reds mm-hmm. into this one, so it explores a little bit further. Yeah, there is a complementary thing with her flesh tones and and the purplish mm-hmm. blue, and then I introduced another a third compliment yeah i guess what is the the it's like a tertiary so what you would call that well the tertiary scheme i guess would be like they would be a a triangular on the color triangular yeah right so would that be try that could be a tertiary type scheme that sounds good yeah let's use it (laughs) Uh, now yeah i guess she isn't like the moon isn't glowing itself there's another uh a different light source above her but um yeah right and um, and so you, even this one, you're keep, keeping it really um, subdued or, or keeping it really limited. Like the um, the fly in the foreground is basically the same greens as the um, as her cloak. Uh, and and you could have gone crazy and introduced you know a, a fourth color or something really warm that jumps you know further forward, but it would detract from her. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I think that I think that works really well. I think maybe that's the solution. And the next time we do this project um the find your style project i wonder if we shouldn't give free reign on color um but i'm just trying to think of ways to help people to solve these problems without getting overwhelmed and whenever we opened the color palette up and we said you know do whatever you want uh it, it seems like that's whenever it, it's not that it's gone off the rails people are still making nice drawings but they're losing sense of value sometimes and just like making these bold swatches of color that that don't relate to each other and confuse the light source and all that kind of stuff. So I wonder if um, if something like this is a good solution. So you start with monochromatic, you maybe move to um, 
uh, you know, adding a second a secondary color, monochromatic with one complementary, you know, mm-hmm. one one element that is complementary. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's too controlling. Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud here, and I hope this is stuff that that you guys will feed back on, and uh, and maybe you'll even try to do in your own work if you find that you're struggling with um, with uh, with keeping true to values whenever you're working with color. Yeah, or um, I mean, a challenge might be to do a monochromatic. But keep, um, and then introduce <clears throat> a complementary color that isn't the uh, the value highlight. You know, yeah. So you have to really think about, you know, your color should not be interrupting your value scale. Your color introduction. Yeah. So you're saying like everything's <clears throat> monochromatic, but but when it, whenever you introduce the secondary color it it has to work within a full value range too or it would it would only be like say your lightest areas are you're going to transition from a cool to a warm light just in your lightest areas well i was just thinking yeah. like challenging them to not to make not it do that the highlight yeah yeah you know make it you know <laughs> still yeah. maintain you know maybe even paint it in a um monochromatic way with all your values and then add something that is a complement, but it isn't your highest, you know, yeah. focus. Yeah, that would be a good challenge, and still keep them keep everyone limited enough in their in the choices that they can make. Uh, uh, that that might be a good way to to, to approach it. Um, what what else What else do you have over there? Is there something that? Uh, um, oh, we want to. You want to. This is kind of following the same idea. This one I think works really effectively um, because it is almost completely monochromatic. It gets a really full value range, and then the only um, complement or the only change in color is right in the in in the face of the of the main figure there, which really jumps forward. I, mean, I guess it and it probably also helps that you divided the background right there with like kind of a um, a value transition, and that also you know moves your eye to that level but um yeah i don't i don't really know what i was thinking there i just sort of seemed nice it's so yeah i did it i think that's what <laughs> i think it worked to, yeah. to do it that way i liked these angles i liked the hit the rim of his hat mm-hmm. and then well the, well the assignment was i mean he he listed like oh, there were i don't know how many guys are in here like see what a like few. five four or five on each I guess eight. Yeah. Eight dudes had to be on the one cover. And I was like, how am I going to do this where it's not going to look like a, an insane, you know, you don't know where your eyes supposed to go. Yeah. So this is how I dealt with it. I'm, I kept all the characters in the monochromatic thing and mm-hmm. then the focus, the giant guy. Yeah. Um, this is the silver manicure anyway. He's sort he's sort of a shadow type character. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the um yeah the thing that works well and and easily could have been lost was with that n- that many figures um all monochromatic and all kind of trying to be subdued so that so that your eye went to this guy um is that you could have lost a lot of the interest in those figures but you didn't because you did push you got a lot of nice edges yeah. and you did push the um you know you got some of your most saturated darks down here and then some pretty strong highlights as a matter of fact some of these lights are pretty close to these lights yeah. Yeah, he, um, he kind of is high up here yeah. with those values. Do you think I, – I know some people when they're building compositions, they think about like triangular – like if you're going to – I think Christina, whenever we were painting with her, maybe said something about like, well, if, the, if I have a highlight here, if I have one like on on the person's head, then I kind of uh, want to try to find one on their collar and then maybe something else here. Like she tends to work around in threes. Mm-hmm. Do you think like that at all or no? Um. I, I, if I do, it's not conscious, you know, I'm, I mean, I am kind of, you know, squinting, looking, backing away. Does this work? Is this too much? Is it drawing you down? You know? Yeah. Um, I did, I, I did have this idea of, you know, a conceptual idea of these, these were the bad guys and these were the good guys and they're facing the light and their, their sh- uh, faces are shadowed. So uh. there was that idea, but I mean, you know, compositionally, I wanted, you know, I mean, I, you know, it was the monochromatic thing with the, with the bright face. 
yeah. with a face that would draw your eye. I almost didn't <clears> notice <throat> that with the light source. That's um, yeah, that's crazy because if the light had been coming maybe from like straight in the center, it would have it, it wouldn't have read as well. Um, that's really what separates. Those two is that the light is catching their features and is catching the back of their heads. Their features are all in shadow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, once you do that, once you start silhouetting their the shadow of their silhouette, you have to kind of choose the background carefully so that they do stick out a little bit more. Yeah, you know, they have they need a little more value behind them so you can see what their faces are doing. Yeah, yeah, so, then, yeah. So you had to go. So like, <clears throat> so pulling these lights in in the background behind these guys was, was a conscious thing because you needed yeah. the silhouette of their face. Right. And and even though his jacket was dark, you just had to let that fall out so that those guys wouldn't get lost. In right. It. Yeah. Um, and see, these are all value decisions. Uh, uh -huh. we're, we're here talking about you know how to not lose value with color, but I think this just shows how vital value is and how much more important than color uh, it is. People you know, love colorful, bright tattoos, but so often they just turn into like uh, just a shitty rainbow, you know, they're just like, <laughs> right. don't look like anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It can really get messy if you really go over the top of the color, I think mm -hmm. too, too much. Mm -hmm. You really got to make your value decisions early right? And, and let your color service that decision, you know? Yeah. I think it's important. I'm going to start doing that in my in my tattoos. I have a few big projects going right now that I haven't gotten into color yet. And uh, I'm going to take this approach with as many of them as I can and see what it does for um, – because I like everyone else, I you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store when it comes to getting inks out and trying to like – make different things pop and find cool color combinations that, that are interesting that I've never seen before. But I'm going to, I'm going to try for a little while just to stay, just to establish my hierarchy within the tattoo and, um, and only use my compliment or only use my color, like, uh, color contrast really selectively and try to keep as much of it monochromatic as possible because I think it's really dynamic and really strong and comic artists have been doing it for, Ever, I mean, most all the successful comic people approach um, their panels this way, huh? Um, you know, I, I'm everyone. not sure. Uh, some do. I mean, I think, you know, I will say that I notice when um, color artists are doing that. You yeah. know, like they mo I could see them, um, you know, uh, painting almost digitally. And then inter monochromatically, and then inter slowly introducing some, some a bit of color to to make the image kind of that much cooler. Yeah, pop it. Yeah, um, I was trying to think of you know, I, and you're way more um, schooled in comic artists than I am. But I was trying to think of people that I like a lot, and I know for sure that um, like Eric Powell, a local Tennessee guy that does the goon, he does that a lot. He uses a lot of monochromatic, um, really cool moonlight kind of stuff with little pops of color, kind of mm -hmm. like you. Um, Alex uh, Alex Ross, he'll use a lot a wide spectrum of colors in some of his. Yeah, yeah, he he really well, he's sticking with the traditional color of like costumes and stuff. Yeah. So, but he, he's able to balance it really well. So you can, you know, uh, see what's happening. His, his, some of his images are very just populated with all kinds of characters. Yeah. So they almost work as this, um, uh, uh I don't know. You come to it and it's almost abstract when you, first yeah, it's, it's it. abstract almost. Huh? And, and you have to, but that's what's fun about it. You can stop and look and see what each character is doing because he spends so much time on each part. Yeah. One thing that I think, you know, I'm, I'm picturing a couple of covers that I've seen of his where there are just tons of figures and maybe they're all kind of similarly sized. Like they don't, he didn't, maybe he didn't have the luxury of having one that was more important in the composition than another. And he'll use something like the crazy bright light source in the background that they're all flying out of. And so yeah. none of them are the focal point, really. Right. Uh, it's, it's like this abstract thing in the background that actually draws you in and it's not until you walk up to it that you actually say like oh shit there's nine people in there i didn't yeah. see any of them yeah um, that's cool that is yeah um all right i know we're we're running a little bit low on time but do you have what's what's the green one there I've just uh this is um let's see there's a this is a you know i don't know uh, a sexy leopard dude yeah in the, good in looking the forest guy. yeah 
So, um, again, the same thing. Very limited. Mm-hmm. Um, complimentary. You've got greens and you know, reddish browns. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, really important, I think, when you're – uh, when you're taking this approach and you're using like a complementary scheme uh, to, to pick one of the, one of the colors, wh- whatever, whichever one you choose as the, uh, one of the compliments and make it bright. If it's bright, the uh, or high key, then the compliment needs to be really subdued. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times people will take like bright blues and bright oranges and think because they're compliments that they yeah. really work well together. But yeah. what they do is compete with each other mm-hmm. a lot and uh, like if you had made that guy too red, then you would have had a real Christmassy looking scene there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, what you were talking about the the um, the triples. Or the the uh, oh yeah, working uh, in tribe. Oh, tertiary second. colors. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. So y- y- the compliment you're you're um, that you want to use is not directly across on the color wheel. Mm-hmm. It's kind of off a little bit. Yeah. You know, which is, I think, what I was thinking of here, you know. I mean, since this was a jungle scene, I had to go with green. Uh, yeah. I wanted them in the jungle, you know, and lots of kind of misty, uh, you know, um, shapes in the background. As you move back into space, you know, these uh, these are going to lose um, their uh, strength in value and also, you know. Uh, yeah. Richness, it, yeah, and, and and intensity, color intensity, yeah, intensity as you yeah. go in different phases in space behind it, right. And then <clears throat> I chose the color. Of course, he was, you know, had uh, like supposed to have leopard uh, skins on him, but you know, I didn't go with this bright, you know, yeah, uh, uh, leopard skin like bright yellow or something. I wanted it to be subdued. He he's supposed to be kind of a subtle shape Mm -hmm. you know yeah he's really not when you first glance at it he's not the focal point none of his because he's in shadow none of his details are really rendered you know like even the the leopard spots are just barely kind of indicated they're not really refined or 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 rendered very fully and if they were then he wouldn't really read it would be confusing because he wouldn't read in the shadows it would you would be like well there's got to be some light on him or i wouldn't see all that stuff and I wanted you to slowly kind of notice the guys behind him, all, the, all his little buddies. Oh, yeah. His yeah. Little, his, like, little, his little leopard guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. I was looking at him. I, I completely missed those guys. Yeah. There's another one. Um, yeah, I see. I see. Um, yeah, I, I think that color intensity, uh, what you mentioned is important as you get away. If we're trying to create any kind of space, you know, so if uh, we're thinking in value first, so, you know, our... Um, you will have more saturation, stronger areas of contrast in the foreground. And then as we move away, less saturation and and less contrast, things will start to gray out. And the easiest way for me to think of that is like if you're looking in, at the mountains, you know, and you look in the right. distance and yeah. all the mountains are really soft and blue mm-hmm. and in the foreground there are purple or whatever. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a big illustrator's trick is to use that yeah. sense. I mean, you know, n- not every day... It, when you go outside is that prominent i mean it is you know when when you look in the distance but some days it's more prominent like <clears throat> given whatever particles are in the air or mist or something is going to obscure it a little more yeah so if you push that it really gives you a sense of space and it's pretty cool when you can pull it off yeah i, I think you i think you made a good point earlier with um if you're thinking in complementaries don't don't cut straight across. Uh, like, don't just split the color wheel and, and say, like, all right, I'm using this yellow, so I want to use this purple. Um, try to move off to the side uh, a little bit and make sure you have a, a reference. That's so hard to do without some type of yeah. some type of reference. It really helps if you can look at a scale. And we, you know, we I've I've mentioned Russ's uh, the Abbott color wheel before, and we don't get any. I mean, we're we're not an affiliate. Well, I guess we. Where we do have it on our website, but I don't even know if we're uh, set up as an affiliate with him. I just think that that's a great tool for tattooers. And it has these gamut masks that go over it. So if you choose a complementary color scheme, you'll have a really thin sliver that shows like one of the uh, this series of colors you can pick. And then when it gets to this side, it'll be twice as wide of a, of a sliver or a slice of pie mm-hmm. or whatever. And, and so you can kind of – you can choose off to the side. And I think that's um, – 
uh, I just think it's a good tool, especially since it's set up for tattooers and it's made with tattoo inks. If you're a painter, um, you know, make your own. I don't know. <laughs> well, you, <clears throat> I, you know what I did Google is color harmonies, which shows more color wheel uh, complementaries and stuff that are different combinations of ideas you can do. It's not directly across the wheel. It's over the side. There's different uh, methods. I can't remember all of them, but um, it's a good way. If you could, if you put harmonies in, yeah. Um, it'll show you so. some more of those. And um, I don't know. Are we going to put up the Abbott wheel? or? Uh, no, I mean, every, I think everyone watching the show probably knows who Russ is, and okay. you can get it from, I think he has them at Tattoo Smart. Um, I guess I should let him know. I'm going to let Russ know that we that we pitched him in this episode just because I think it's a good tool and it also places those colors on a value scale which solves, solves a lot of those problems for you um so if you are dealing with an area of light and you pull up um you know you have three different reds or oranges you want to use you can actually go to the wheel and say all right which one is actually the light if you can't see it and some people have problems like um I don't know if it's not it's color blindness, but value blindness. Like color, people <laughs> yeah. confuse color intensity for um, for high value. High value, yeah. yeah. And so, and and that solves a lot of those problems because it drops that color on a value scale from dark to light uh, at the same time as it works in the spectrum of colors. So uh, it's just a good tool for that if you're having a hard time. And you know, I. Th- I, I hadn't thought about it when I brought the idea for this episode. I was like, man, we need to like brainstorm on a way to, to help people solve this problem of forgetting value when they go into color. But I think that we just solved it right there. I think we just keep or if, I'm not trying to pitch just for our class, but if I think that if you guys just, if you're struggling with this, uh, stay super monochromatic and just introduce pops of color. It's worked. It works for you know professional illustrators. Um, it should work for you and your tattooing mm. as well. I think it would. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, glad That's we solved all idea. those problems. Yeah. Well, how much are we selling next this episode time for? We're going to solve be an expensive the episode. other what? world issues like uh, uh, like climate change and oh okay I thought you meant like nuclear oh. proliferation so. proliferation. <laughs> You don't, you don't use those kind of words here. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you. Uh, we're we're going to go eat some raviolis or something. Uh, uh, make sure to subscribe to our mailing list. If you are interested in um, – we're going to do this Inside Fireside program again. We're going to do it uh, hopefully a little bigger and better next time. And uh, Well, not bigger. Smaller and better. Less people, right? I think, yeah, I think yeah. we're going to limit it to maybe, like maybe eight. eight people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you want to be one of the eight people that gets in on this next time around and work one-on-one with, with Adam and I and let us draw on top of your drawings, um, we'll include <laughs> a link in this episode in the show notes, and you can click. Uh, what have we been doing? We've just been getting them to email, say, I want in. Can we just do a link instead? Like we can do like a pop-up uh, that just says. Yeah, for a sign-up. Yeah, we'll just you do mean that here. It'll be right here. Uh, now nah, it'll be in the show. I don't know how to put it on the screen. <laughs> oh, that's, can, oh, that's high tech. We'll put it in the show notes. Oh. There'll just be a link that says, "I want to be part of the next program," or "I want more information." You're not committing to anything. Uh, it's not going to be there. <laughs> you're, you're just going to look like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you guys. Have a good night or day. Bye. <laughs>